All right, we move on to elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. So this is actually the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm ECDSA is the elliptic curve anal analog of the DSA. So we already seen what a digital signature algorithm is. So now we are going to see how the elliptic curve analog of it works. Okay. So the ECDSA was first proposed in 1992 by Scott Vanston in the paper published in 1992. In response to this request for public comments on their first proposal for digital signature standard. It was accepted in 1998 as an ISS standard, and it was later on accepted as ANSI, American Nation Standard Institute standard. And in 2000, it was accepted as an IEEE standard, and it also appears in FIPS 186-2. I said that the current draft version is 186-5 and ECDSA is also there. Okay, so it is not going to going anywhere uh, in the recent years. But of course, it has also included the many standards in the last two decades, decades. So you can see elliptic or digital signature algorithm in almost everywhere. Okay. So uh, like the digital signature algorithm, we are going to have our parameters. So our ECDSA domain parameters actually consist of the following two. First, a suitably chosen elliptic curve E defined over a finite field FQ of characteristic P, and the base point G, which is an element of this elliptic curve, which is defined over the finite field FQ. Okay. So domain parameters may either be shared by a group of entities or specific to a single user. This is what I was trying to explain. In the Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything, we simply choose these parameters and may share it among everybody. So in the Bitcoin, this uh, elliptic curve and the point base point G is shared among everybody. Okay, but the, here it looks very simple, but as you can see, a suitably chosen elliptic curve actually uh, is not something that can be easily done. So there you have to, you know, carefully choose your elliptic curve because there are many elliptic curves which you can define over the finite field FQ, but you have to choose it in a very clever way. So here we are going to talk about how you choose it. So the domain parameters for ECDSA comprise of a field size Q, where either Q equals to P, so a node prime, or Q equals to the 2 to the power M. So actually, this is what I mentioned. Actually, instead of 2, you can choose any prime number, for instance, like 7. This is also a field. But uh, the standards forces us to use either a huge prime number or use uh, a power of 2. So they don't actually allow you to do use something else. This is mostly due to simplicity and also for performance. So another thing for the domain parameter is an indication FR, which is field representation. So this is actually used to, for the representation for the elements of FQ. So you have to specify how you represent your elements of this field. Actually, in theory, how you represent an element shouldn't affect anything in theory your representation actually only changes the representation. But in practice, your choice of representation may affect the performance. Okay, so this is why it is somewhat important here. Optionally, uh, there may be a, a bit string seed E of length at least 256 bits if the elliptic curve was generated in accordance with random generation methods. So in standards, we have some uh, elliptic curves that are predefined. But some people does not trust those elliptic curves because they might think that maybe they are chosen because there's a backdoor in them. Okay, this is why actually uh, Satoshi didn't use a NIST elliptic curve. Okay, so one way is to generate randomly, but if you generate it in a random way, as described here, so in this scenario, you actually choose a random number and feed it into a hash function like SHA-256, and the results will be used for the parameter selection of your elliptic curve. So you, the random elliptic curves is a common topic, and some people prefer to do it, and it actually is a good idea. But if you don't use such a random curve, for instance, if you are going to use a curve that is standard in a 
that is defined in a standard, then you don't need such a seed here. And in the case of Bitcoin, as you remember, we use a SEGP 256K1 elliptic curve, which is defined not in a NIST standard, but someplace else. So for this reason, there we don't have this kind of a seed. Okay. So our domain parameters also involve A and B, which we discussed before. So these two elements, A and B, are in FQ. They are field elements, which define the equation of the elliptic curve curve E over FQ. So, so far we generally focused on the prime modulus. So this will, this was our FP, our field was FP, where P is a large prime number. So in that scenario, an elliptic curve is defined as Y squared equals the X cube plus AX plus B. So you have to choose which A and B you are using. So uh, there are many choices you can have, but if you define, uh, if you choose your field as uh, 2 to the m, then the elliptic curve definition changes slightly. Now it becomes y squared plus xy equals to x cubed plus ax squared plus b. Okay, but here you can choose a equals to 0 or 1 or b equals to 0 or 1. And these, these are actually referred to as Koblitz curves. And these are, uh, when you make the, the choice, the curves are really fast. So which are actually used by Koblitz for many uh, cases. So next thing you need to choose is the two field elements, X, G, and Y, G in, in FQ, which define a point G equals to X, G, Y, G of prime order in the elliptic curve. So here actually it tells that you have to find the point on this elliptic curve whose coordinates are X and Y, which are an, which are element of FQ. Also, the this point should have prime order. This means that when you add G to itself, you know you obtain other elements in the group, and you know the uh, number of elements you obtain in this way in this elliptic curve should have prime order. So it should generate prime many numbers. Let's say. So the order n. So this order of the point G should be larger than two to the 256. I wrote this because due to the Polar's row algorithm, you know, the secret is half due to the square root operation. So this is why I wrote 256 here. But of course, if you are using something else, it should also be four times square root of Q. And there's also another thing that we define the cofactor. Since N is the order of the point G, it can be less than the number of all of the points in the elliptic curve because G might not be a, the generator of this group, okay? So a, in the largest case, N equals to this number, so hash equals to one. So the smallest hash you can get is one. But if this N is small, this hash increases. And actually you can look at the standard documentations and there they actually, uh, did tell you what's an upper bound for H is. So if you choose H really large, uh, those standards wouldn't allow you to use it. For instance, for the case of this kind of parameters, I think uh, in FIPS documents, hash is around two to the 12 or two to the 14. So if you choose very small N, it will exceed it. So they wouldn't allow you to have such a cofactor. So if you go back, I said actually domain parameters are actually two things, you know, sort of the chosen elliptic curve and the base point, but how you choose it actually is a little bit more complicated as you can see here. So, but once you do it, actually you uh, write them uh, when you actually represent your elliptic curve, okay? So assume that now we have chosen our domain parameters. Again, in the Bitcoin case, the elliptic curve is already chosen by the Satoshi. So we already have these domain parameters for everybody. Now, every user needs to generate their own private and public keys so that uh, they will use their public keys as Bitcoin uh, wallet addresses. So you will be actually transferring a cryptocurrency to the hash of public keys most of the time in almost every cryptocurrency. And the person who has the private key will actually sign something when they want to 
redeem their monies and send it to somebody else. So for this reason, we need key pairs. So an elliptic or digital signature algorithm key pair is associated with a particular set of EC domain parameters, which we already chosen in the previous slide. The public key is a random multiple of the base point, while the private key is the integer used to generate the multiples. Okay. So an entity's A's key pair is associated with a particular set of elliptic curve domain parameters. These are the actually the seven things I explained in the previous slide. You know, your field size, the, your field representation. A and B is the uh, constants in, pro, in front of the uh, in the definition of your elliptic curve. G is your base point. N is the order of G, and H is the cofactor. Okay. So you have to define this before you start generating pairs. So this association can be assured cryptographically, for example, using with certificates or by context, for example, all entities use the same domain parameter. So for the case of Bitcoin or Ethereum or any other cryptocurrency, we are talking about the second case because due to the context, we already know these parameters because the elliptic curve is already chosen in that way. The entity A must have the assurance that the domain parameters are valid prior to key generation or signature verification and so on. So this is very important. So you might think that, why would I actually need to check if these domain parameters are correct, right? Most people don't do it whenever they see a domain parameter. But I want to you know, give a break to our discussion of elliptic or digital signature algorithm and talk about something very recent. So this is like two weeks ago. OpenSSL Security Advisory actually announced the following high severity CVE, and it's titled Infinite Loop in BN Mode Square Root Reachable When Parsing Certificates. So uh, it is a very nice denial of service attack. I want to include as a, you know, something uh, recent. So the BN Mode Square Root function, which computes a modular square root, contains a bug that can cause it to loop forever for non-prime moduli, okay? Internally, this function is used when parsing certificates that contain elliptic curve public keys in compressed form or explicit elliptic curve parameters with a base point encoded in compressed form. So in compressed form, I actually mentioned before, in the uncompressed form, for a base point, we actually put the X coordinate and Y coordinate together. So it is uncompressed. But when you say it is compressed, you don't mention the Y coordinate, you simply give the X coordinates because from the X coordinates, anybody can calculate the Y coordinate. But we talked this about before, there will be two points with the same X coordinates. And generally, standards say that take the uh, you know, smaller Y value as the uh, that points for the you know compressed version. So here, the compressed form means that. Yeah. So in this bug, it is possible to trigger the infinite loop by crafting a certificate that has invalid explicit curve parameters. So this is why I said that you have to check if those parameters are correct. So here, the problem is that when you uh, craft a certificate that has invalid explicit curve parameters, OpenSSL tries to verify it. So since certificate parsing happens prior to verification of the certificate signature, any process that parses an externally supplied certificate may thus be subject to a denial of service attack due to this infinite loop. The infinite loop can also be reached when parsing crafted private keys as they can contain explicit elliptic curve parameters. So they list this as follows. Vulnerable situations include TLS clients consuming server certificates, TLS servers consuming client certificates, hosting providers taking certificates or private keys from customers, certificate authorities parsing certification requests from subscribers, anything else which parses ASN.1 elliptic curve parameters. So actually, almost in every situation, you might be susceptible to a denial of service attack. Here, ASN.1 is actually a method of you know, representing parameters to provide interoperability between different languages. So anything that uses this, an attacker can create an infinite loop. Moreover, also any other application that use the BM mode square root where the attacker can control the parameter values are vulnerable to this denial of service issue. So, uh, you know, uh, 
I already mentioned that you have to be sure these parameters are correct here. You know, you have to uh, have the assurance that the domain parameters are valid. This is actually the sentence maybe from 1990s, but as you can see, in 15 March 2022, we still observe bugs that actually does this wrong in a wrong way. Okay, so this is why you know choosing an elliptic curve and verifying that those choices are correct are important. Okay, you have to implement it in a, also in a correct way. Okay, now we can uh, continue again with the elliptic curve digital signature key pair generation. So it looks like in the case of Algamal, Algamal it is simple. The each and state does the following. Select a random or pseudo random integer D in the interval one to the N minus one. Compute D times G, which means that you know G is the base point. You add G to itself D many times. So this is a scalar multiplication. And at the end, you will obtain an, another point on the curve. Okay, so your public key is this point Q, your private key is actually this number D, okay? Because you added G to itself D many times and people doesn't know how many times you added to itself to obtain Q. So that is the base idea. So let's look at now the, at the signature generation. To sign a message M, an entity A with domain parameters as defined here, and associated key pair D and Q does the following. D is your private key. Again, remember that Q is your public key. <clears throat> Again, for every message, you have to select a random or pseudo random integer K. Again, if you use K twice, or if you publicly announce your K value, uh, anybody can capture your uh, private key D, okay? When we talk about Bitcoin security, I will focus on this more. So you continue as follows, since you randomly chose K, you compute K times G, which gives you actually a coordinate of a point, and convert this X coordinate of this point to an integer. So how you convert the field element to an integer actually defined in the standards, most of the time everybody uses answer X9.62. So there actually it is defined how you convert this number, the field element into the integer. For the prime fields, it is easy, you know, easy to guess, but when you work on vectors like where the field is two to the M, the conversion might change, okay? So now X1 bar is integer. You calculate more of it to obtain R. If R is zero, then go to step one and choose another random K. So this is important when some people doesn't implement this and doesn't check if R is zero, so they don't implement it in this way. They think that this rarely happens, so there's no need to check. But if you're unlucky, this happens, and you know things might be broken due to this. You you know uh, overlooked it. But if it is not zero, now you calculate the inverse of k modulo n. So you compute the your hash of your message. In Bitcoin, they use SHA two hundred and fifty six, and convert this output bit string to an integer e. Okay. Now you compute S as follows, E plus D times R. Remember D is your private key. K inverse, multiplicative inverse is used here and K is the random K you chose for this signature. You, so this way you calculate S as in the case of digital signature algorithm, but if S equals to zero, you also go back to step one and do everything again. But if it is not zero, then a signature for the message M is RS, very similar to the digital signature algorithm. So once we sign it now, so this is actually your signature for a Bitcoin transaction now, okay? Now everybody should be able to verify it. To verify the signature RS on the message M, B obtains an authentic copy of A's domain parameters. Again, for the cryptocurrencies, we everybody uses the same, same domain parameter, so this is not a problem. They also need to have the associated public key Q, okay? So in the Bitcoin transactions, we will see that you uh, provide it, okay? It is recommended that B also validates D and Q. Uh, B then does the following. I always focus on this, as you can see, if you don't do it, and bugs that happened in OpenSSS, similar bugs can happen to you. So it is always 
a good idea to validate these parameters. But once you have this, you verify the signature as follows. First, you verify that RNS are integers in this interval. Otherwise, they would be fake, okay? Compute the hash of the message and convert again it to an integer E. Compute S inverse modulo N. Compute U1, which is E times W. E is the hash of this message, you know. Then calculate U2, which is R times W. Compute U1 times G plus U2 times G. So you obtain the point X. If X is the point at infinity, then reject the signature. Otherwise, convert the X coordinate of X1 of X to an integer X bar and compute if uh, X modulo N, which equals to V. Then what you do is to check if V equals to R. So you accept the signature if and only if the R value that you obtain with the signature equals to this calculation. Okay, this is what we already did in the case of digital signature algorithms, but the difference was that now we were working on elliptic curve points. So instead of a, instead of a ZP star, now we work on elliptic curve EFQ. But now let's see the proof why this works. So proof that the signature verification works. If a signature RS on a message M was indeed generated by A, then this is how they generated it, like, right? Because S equals to this. If this is a correct signature, they generated S like this. So if you rearrange this, you know, take K minus one to here and S inverse there. Actually, this means that multiply both sides with K and also multiply both sides with S inverse. This is what you get. K is congruent to this. But you know, due to associated property, you can take this multiplication here. So this is what you get, right? But due to our definitions, we defined S inverse when we verify the signature, we said that W equals the S inverse modulo N. So this actually means this, right? So this is how we chose U1 and U2. So actually K equals to this modulo N. So when we, calculated U1G plus U2G, what we did actually was, if you, since Q equals to D times G, if you take the, everything as the G power, this is what you get U1 plus U2D, which is actually K here, right? So this is KG. So this is Y, V equals to R as required, okay? So it is a very simple, uh, method to check actually we are simply using number theory and uh, algebra but uh, this way you can be confident that if the signature is correct this is this uh, check which is if r equals to v actually works